Hi, I'm Chris and I watch movies. Welcome to my series spotlighting influential and legendary movie directors that I have aptly named Director Spotlight. In this series, I shall be shining a light on film directors. I'll be giving a brief biography of their lives as well as going through their filmography and highlighting some of the films they made that had an impact on cinema history. And most likely geeking out about specific movies that I love and sharing my general bias. Curse your inevitable bias. Oh, Firefly references. Of every director I'll talk about on this series, only one that I can think of has the distinction of having one of his movies guaranteed to be played on TV every year. Long before the word auteur got into public uh, consciousness, uh, he was an auteur. Well, he called it one man on film. One of the things I always got from the Capra pictures was his great storytelling, his great sense of storytelling. The unimposing little fellow nearest the camera may not look like a great director, but don't let that fool you. The name's Capra. Frank Capra. Frank takes his fame very seriously. Very seriously. Frank Capra's films envisioned America not necessarily how it was, but how it wished to view itself. An idealized place where senators stood up against corruption, people do the right thing despite adversity, and the things you cherish are the people that you love, not necessarily the possessions that you inevitably can't take with you. His films were always on the side of hope, that even if the world wasn't perfect, there was still light at the end of every tunnel. Francesco Rosario Capra was born in 1897 in Sicily, the youngest of seven children in a Roman Catholic household. His family immigrated to the United States when he was five, an extremely poor family, making his rise to be one of the most sought after directors in Hollywood, a truly American story. And if there's one thing you can say about Frank Capra, it's that he was a true and very proud American. He grew up in an east side ghetto of Los Angeles, delivering newspapers and working other odd jobs until he was 18. After that, he studied chemical engineering at the California Institute of Technology. Capra hated being trapped in the poor slums of LA, saying, quote, about the time, all I had was cockiness, and let me tell you, that gets you a long way. While staying in San Francisco in his early 20s, Capra basically talked his way into directing a short silent film, and by talking his way, I mean lying about how much experience he had. He later started out in Hollywood writing jokes for the popular Our Gang serial, but was fired because he wasn't writing jokes that were, quote, cute enough. But he eventually struck up a partnership and friendship with Harry Cohen, who was running a small, no-budget film studio at the time, Columbia Pictures. Because of Frank's background in chemical engineering, he adapted to sound filmmaking a lot better than most Hollywood directors did at the time. In his first year with Columbia, he directed nine films. Side note, I feel like I need a nap after going to the grocery store. Capra had a lot of freedom at Columbia Pictures and eventually became one of their most essential directors. He made a stirring drama, Lady for a Day, a film noir called American Madness, and four films starring Barbara Stanwyck, whom he started a love affair with. One of those Barbara Stanwyck movies is The Bitter Tea of General Yen, which has some very striking visuals, but is also very racist. Capra often used the same writer, Robert Riskin, and the same cameraman, Joseph Walker, which would help cement Capra as a auteur director, giving all of his films a very similar look and feel. In 1934, Capra made his first enduring classic, It Happened One Night, a romantic comedy starring Claudette Colbert and Clark Gable in what I think might be his best performance. The two fall in love after being forced to go on a road trip together. Spoiler. The studios were unsure about this movie, given the fact that the working title was Night Bus, and a few films they had made before that took place on buses had not done well. The film is fairly risque for the time, given that it came out before the MPA production code. Just a few years later, scenes like this famous one would not have been allowed. It Happened One Night set the standard for the romantic comedy road movie, as well as winning five Academy Awards and putting Columbia Pictures on the map. Capper wasn't very content with success, however, and suffered from crippling depression. His discomfort with financial success during the Great Depression is somewhat materialized in 1936's Mr. Deeds Goes to Town. Mr. Deeds Goes to Town is about Longfellow Deeds, a simple greeting card writer played by Gary Cooper who inherits millions only for it to bring him nothing but trouble. The ending is pure Capra as Longfellow Deeds gives away all of his millions, and another great thing about Mr. Deeds Goes to Town is that it doesn't star Adam Sandler. In 1937, Capra made Lost Horizon, an epic fantasy film about the lost and magical city of Shangri-La. The movie went way over budget, and the rough cut was reportedly six hours long. So the studio cut it down and made changes, which resulted in Capra having a falling out with both Columbia Pictures and Harry Cohen. Since then, Lost Horizon has gone on to be considered a classic, and Capra would come back to 
Columbia Pictures to make 1938's You Can't Take It With You. A charming romantic comedy based on a hit Broadway play and featuring a huge cast. But probably more importantly, it was the first big performance for an actor that Capra picked because he, quote, fit his concept for an idealized American. That actor's name was Jimmy Stewart. You Can't Take It With You went on to win the Academy Awards for both Best Picture and Best Director and ends up being one of Capra's most homespun American films. Like, if this film were a food, it would be a slice of apple pie. Jimmy Stewart was the perfect casting choice for Capra's next film and what some might say his absolute best, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Whether you think it's his best film or not, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington is Frank Capra wearing his ideals overtly on his sleeve. Jimmy Stewart plays a newly appointed senator who's meant to act as a naive patsy for a corrupt political system. Stewart's Mr. Smith, however, fights against the corruption and holds a filibuster, which makes it, I think, the only film I can think of to have a stirring and riveting climax in the shape of a filibuster on the Senate floor. Although Capra's view of the world seems to be filled with corruption and cynicism, he insists that the will of good-natured hard-working and honest human beings is something to be admired. And Mr. Smith stands as an example of what a single human being can accomplish through decency. One of the only places that Mr. Smith was not well received was Washington, because how dare Frank Capra suggest that American politicians might be corrupt. Capra left Columbia Pictures, the studio he'd helped shape, and chose Warner Brothers to make his next film, Meet John Doe. Another film about political corruption, but this time from a much darker perspective. He also made Arsenic and Old Lace around this time, a madcap comedy starring Cary Grant, who is practically a cartoon. See this movie, it's hilarious. Look, I probably should have told you this before, but you see, well, insanity runs in my family. It practically gallops. Then, just as it always does, World War II happened. And with a strong desire to serve his country, and despite being 44, Capra joined the army, even giving up the presidency for the Screen Directors Guild. Capra made seven documentaries during World War II, which were known as the Why We Fight series, which was meant to inform soldiers for the reasons and principles of combat. Today, they're regarded as some of the best informational documentaries made about World War II. Winston Churchill was even a fan, showing all of the films to the British public. After the war, Capra co-founded Liberty Films, so as to free himself from the studio interference that had plagued him since he became a success. And the first film he made for Liberty showcased the heaviness that Capra had gained during the war. It's a film about suicide and the loss of dreams and innocence, but most know it as It's a Wonderful Life. Yay! Hello, Bedford Ford! It's a Wonderful Life shows glimpses of Capra's dark side. George Bailey spends most of the film feeling like his life is a waste. But when he's shown a vision of what the world would be like had he never existed, it's proven that, oh no, it could be a lot worse. It's a Wonderful Life only ran for two weeks and was quickly forgotten, barely making back its expenses. Truly the best thing that happened to the film was that it fell into the public domain, therefore making it easier to show on television every year at Christmas where it gained momentum and is now as regarded as one of his most beloved films. It's kind of hard to imagine this, but it'd be the equivalent if in 60 years Philomena was regarded as one of the best films ever made. See how I shoehorned in my love for the underrated Philomena? It's a Wonderful Life has everything we've come to associate with Frank Capra movies. Romance, comedy, homegrown American values. It's full of great characters. It's about the persistence that one man's life can truly change the world, and it makes me cry every time. Don't even play that one scene. Don't, don't play it. No. To my big brother George, the richest man in town. I'm gonna need a minute. Capra went back to what he knew best in 1948 and made State of the Union, which was based on a very popular play at the time, just like two of his other successes. The film, however, was not a success, and burned by the loss of his studio Liberty Films to Paramount, Frank quit directing for a while. But Hollywood had changed. It was far less studio-driven, and Frank seemed to have a lot less control over a production than he used to have. Capra's ideals and messages also seemed to resonate more with America during the Great Depression than it did with the economic boom of the 1950s. He made other films with Frank Sinatra and Bing Crosby, but none were very successful, and Capra retired at the age of 55. Later, he published his autobiography called The Name Above the Title, which was a huge success. Frank Capra lived to be 94 years old, passing away in his sleep in 1991, but his films live on. Capra's American values, his witty dialogue, and his dark undertones have influenced filmmakers like Steven Spielberg, Ron Howard, Robert Altman, and Martin Scorsese. His films remain popular and poignant because they are both timeless and very much of their time, showing a picture of America that maybe never truly was, but how we always wish that it someday could be. 
While cynics turn their nose up at Capra's optimism, fans of the great director never feel cheated by his happy endings, or his messages of hope because they never come off as cheap or forced. Capra's characters always go through hell before things turn out alright in the end. And like the director himself, his films are rags to riches stories. And as corny as the ideals may seem, were unquestionably real for the man himself. Thanks for watching. Please join me next time as I profile another director. Next time it will be a much more recent filmmaker, someone you've definitely heard of and who is, you know, still alive. Also, please leave comments, share the video, follow me on social media, but more importantly, go watch movies.